a character who says enough things and does enough things to become more complex. And this is particularly true of characters who have um, many episodes devoted to them. People like Abraham, Joseph, um, David, of course people like uh, Jesus in the Gospels, uh, the, the disciples in the Gospels. We keep coming back to them. And so over time, they develop into round characters. Um, so here on the slide, the example I've given is just of Abraham in Genesis 18, uh, where he hears that he's going to become the father, or rather Sarah is going to become the mother of Abraham's child of promise. Um, so three types of characters. So it's helpful when you come to a narrative is to go through it and identify who are the flat characters, who are the agents, and who are the round characters. And one of the main reasons for identifying them as such is this. It is that round characters give us, as preachers, more potential. Because if we have a character who is more complex, it's easier then to I was going to use the word exploit, that's not quite the word, but you know what, we can utilize, we can utilize that character who is more complex in different ways in a sermon simply because they're more interesting. There's more to say about them and they have a major role to play in the narrative. So let me illustrate this. Um, we've been looking largely at uh, Old Testament passages up to now, but let's go to a New Testament passage. Uh, we'll go to John chapter 9. Now, John chapter 9 is the story of uh, the man born blind. It's an extensive narrative. Uh, John chapter 9 is quite long. So uh, I'm assuming for this purpose that we uh, can remember in general terms what the story of Jesus and the man born blind is about. I'm sure that's true. Many of you, I'm sure, will have preached um, on this passage. Um, so we're going to have a look at the way in which different characters are presented in John chapter 9. So we're going to start with the disciples. So characterization uh, here simply means the way in which characters are presented and developed. So the disciples then are there in John chapter 9. And the disciples ask one theological question. Okay? I've had some students who over a three or four year degree course have only asked one theological question. Uh, the disciples here ask their single theological question. You remember what it was? They say, Master, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And that question is the kind of trigger which sets off the whole trajectory of John chapter 9. Uh, Jesus answers the question and then we move on from there with the blind man. Um, so the disciples are agents. Their question sets in train the whole series of events. The disciples never appear again in John chapter 9. They're there in verse 2, ask their question, and then they disappear. So they are agents to, to move this story on. Then we have the characterization of Jesus. So in, in this narrative then, Jesus pronounces in verse 5, he says, I am the light of the world. He also gives sight to the blind man in verses 6 to 7. He then asks the blind man if he believes. That's in verse 35. Verse 39, he says he came into the world so that the blind might see and vice versa. That's in verse 39. Uh, he tells some of the Pharisees that they are blind. So, what kind of character is Jesus? Well, Jesus in this narrative is a flat character. Now, when I say that, um, sometimes people can, you know, may, may look a little shocked. Now, people say, what do you mean he's a flat character? You know, he's the son of God. Yes, yes, I know, 
but what role does Jesus have in this narrative? And essentially in this narrative, Jesus is a flat character because essentially there's one characteristic repeated throughout and it's all to do with light and darkness, sight and blindness. And you'll notice something is that Jesus is absent between verse 7 and verse 35. There's a large gap in the middle of the story in which Jesus does not say anything or do anything. So what Jesus says and does, is it important? Well, of course it's important. Yes, of course it is. But he isn't developed. It's a single, basically a single idea repeated many times. So Jesus is a flat character in this narrative. Then let's have a look at the blind man. The, uh, the blind man um, tells people uh, in verses 11 and 12, he tells people how he was healed. He tells the Pharisees how he was healed. He, he says that Jesus is a... Um, excuse me, he says that Jesus is a prophet in verse 17. Then he says he doesn't know if Jesus is a sinner or not in verse 25. Um, he asks the Jews, you remember this is a deliciously ironic moment in the narrative, he asks the Jews if they want to be Jesus' disciples, you remember? He said, do you too want to become his disciples? Um, it's in verse 27. Then he confesses that Jesus is not a sinner and is from God. Uh, and then, in verse 38, he believes Jesus is the Son of Man and worships him. So, in this narrative then, the blind man is a round character. He's got enough space in this narrative to develop. For example, he moves from saying that he doesn't know if Jesus is a sinner or not, to saying that he definitely is not. His attitude concerning Jesus changes as the narrative moves on. So he is a much more complex character. So as far as preaching this uh, passage is concerned, or maybe I should just mention this as well, in addition to the blind man being a complex character, uh, the Pharisees and Jews are also round characters too because they, they move on a little bit in this narrative from simple curiosity to outright opposition. So the Jews and the Pharisees are also round characters. Um, but in preaching on this passage, the character which gives us greatest potential for development as far as a character is concerned is the blind man because his complexity means we can utilize the blind man's experience. Because in this narrative, the emphasis is on how the blind man relates to Jesus, rather than on how Jesus relates to the blind man. After all, Jesus is absent for more than 20 verses in the middle of this narrative. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't relate to the blind man but the story is more concerned with how the blind man relates to Jesus. So the blind man then becomes a, becomes a character that um, the congregation can identify with. So for example, just as a, a suggestion in developing this uh, in a sermon, um, we could ask of ourselves or of those in the congregation, which blind man are you? Because in our congregations, we may have people at various stages in their relationship with Christ. So which blind man are you? Because there are several blind men in the story. One man, but several attitudes. Are you the blind man? Are you the blind man who uh, says Jesus is a prophet? Uh, are you the one who isn't sure if Jesus is a sinner? Uh, are you the blind man who knows that Jesus is not a sinner? Or are you at the point where the blind man is willing to worship Jesus 
as the Son of Man. And in any given congregation, we may have people there who might identify with any one of those positions. But the blind man, the complexity of the blind man, means that we can utilize that character to address the various spiritual situations of people in our congregation. Another aspect of, the, um, of characters, and uh, this just picks up on something we've already uh, touched on, is that occasionally the Bible will use physical description, and the physical description itself gives us some insight into the character. We've already looked at this briefly, but we'll bring it in here because it's significant for characters too. Um, talking of Ehud, Ehud, the, uh, remember the left-handed man, the one restricted in his right hand? He presented the tribute to King Eglon of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And uh, we may wonder, well, I mean, who cares? You know, well, obviously uh, Eglon might, but uh, why, why mention it? What's the point of telling us that Eglon was, was a very fat man? Well, the fact that Israel is sending tribute to King Eglon, and Eglon is a very fat man, means he's getting an awful lot of tribute. And he is living on the fat of the land. Um, so he is living in luxury. So just a small physical detail and yet it conveys more than just the physical point that he, he's overweight. We saw um, in the first session with Absalom, um, his self-centeredness centering on, on his hair. All we're really told is he's got an awful lot of hair, he cuts it, and he, it weighs, but that tell, it weighs an awful lot, but that tells us something about the character. Okay, so physical description is always significant and frequently, whenever it, usually when it's used, it's an insight into the character of the person. Another aspect to bear in mind when looking at characters is when the Bible gives us insight into the uh, person's inner life. Usually, as we'll see in just a moment, usually the Bible restricts its comments concerning characters to what a character says and what a character does. But not very often does it tell us what they are thinking. Whenever a biblical narrative gives us explicit information about what somebody is thinking, it is always, always highly significant because it is not done very often. But when it is done, it is because it's essential that we take notice of it. So let's look at a couple of examples of the uh, way in which a narrator takes us to the inner life of someone. In Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, Esau said to whom? Esau said to himself. This is his inner dialogue with himself. Our omniscient narrator gives us insight into what is in Esau's heart. The days of mourning for my father approaching, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Uh, it is interesting that this insight here gives us an idea, a very, well, an infallible idea as to the kind of character that Esau is. He has murderous designs. If you remember the story as it develops, when we come to Genesis chapter 33, when Esau does meet his brother, what does he do? Do you remember? He runs to meet him, throws his arms around him, and kisses him. Uh, incidentally, remember intertextuality we were talking about? Can you think of another biblical story in which somebody runs, throws his arms around, and kisses. And that is the story of the prodigal son, the father forgiving the son. And I would suggest this is the way in which Genesis is telling us. It is Esau saying, I'm no longer like this. Forgiveness for what you may have done. Um, but at this point, 
he's willing to murder his brother. Um, then um, a verse that we looked at in the first session with Delilah and Samson. She said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And when he awoke from his sleep, he thought, he thought. Doesn't say this out loud, but the narrator takes us into the mind of Samson. What is he thinking? I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. What does that inner statement of Samson tell us about him? Well, at least it tells us he has become complacent. Here's a problem, I'll just deal with it as I've always done. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. So what he thinks contrasts with reality. He's not going to shake himself free as from before. But verses such as these, which give us the narrator's insight into the mind of the character, are gold dust for preachers, because it gives us an infallible insight into what is motivating this character. We don't have to guess. We don't have to look inductively. It is an explicit indication given to us by the narrator. However, the, the major way in which the Bible conveys its characters is largely restricted to speech and actions. That is to say, we are told what characters say, and we are told what characters do. Only occasionally are we told what they are thinking. So, what we need to do then is to take into account, look carefully at what characters say, look carefully at what characters do, and then interpret those words and those actions. The way we can interpret it is by looking at the story, the narrative as a whole, asking ourselves what characteristics of biblical narrative are working in the larger picture and that will enable us to interpret what these characters say and do. For example, um, if we ask the question, you know, why do characters speak or act as they do? In 2 Samuel 11, where we have the story of David and Bathsheba, it's normally talked that, of that way, but I think it sh we should say David, Bathsheba, and Uriah, for Uriah is a very important character. You remember what's happened, uh, David has um, seen Bathsheba, well he's done more than see her, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, she has told him that she is pregnant, and then David tells Joab to bring you, send Uriah back to the palace. And um, what do we think David's going to say to Uriah? Presumably, we say, he's going to say, look Uriah, I'm sorry about this, but look, we'll have to find a way of... Uh, dealing with it. Now Uriah came to him and David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going, you know, past the time of day and then David said to Uriah, uh, go down to your house and uh, <clears throat> wash your feet. Now he repeats this many times in the story, does David. Uriah, go down to your house spend time with Bathsheba, but never, never does the story tell us why does David want Uriah to go down to his house and spend time with Bathsheba? He never tells us, but we know, don't we? I see many of you nodding your heads. We know, even though the narrator never tells us and how do we know then? Because we interpret what David says and we interpret what David does in the context of the story. And we say to ourselves, that's why he wants him to go down and spend some time with Bathsheba. Um, here's another example. Um, this is from the story of Joseph at the, 
almost at the end of that story, in Genesis 50. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Your father gave this instruction before he died. Did he? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Because if he did, we have to believe the brothers. Would you buy a second-hand car from Joseph's brothers? Did he or did he not say that? Why does Joseph weep? Well, it could be he's so saddened by the fact they have not already accepted the forgiveness that he's given them. But you see, we need to interpret the words of these brothers. It's possible that they're telling the truth but it may be more than likely that they're not because there is no record anywhere in the, in the Bible that Jacob ever said it. So if you're going to believe it, you have to believe the brothers, but as we all know, the brothers have a track record of lying to their father. Are they now lying about their father? Uh, then there's something else that um, we should bear in mind, and that is in looking at people's speech in particular, what tone of voice is being used? Let me just read this passage. This is from Judges 6 concerning Gideon. And I'll read it with, with, as far as possible without any uh, expression. And then we'll see uh, what tone of voice should we read this. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak of Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abbey Ezrite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. Gideon answered him, But sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where, is all his, where are all his wonderful deeds that our ancestors recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has cast us off and given us into the hand of Midian. I'd suggest you don't read scripture readings like that, but basically without any expression. But what tone of voice is implied here? So here we have Gideon. He's hiding from the enemy. How does the angel speak to him? The Lord is with you, you mighty warrior, as he's hiding in the wine press. Or, the Lord is with you, <laughs> you mighty warrior. Um, and how does Gideon answer him? Does he answer him like this? But sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonderful deeds that our ancestors recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has cast us off and given us into the hand of Midian. Now, if you have a high wooden pulpit in your church, you may be tempted you know, to read it like that. Or should it be read like this? Sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our ancestors recounted to us? saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has cast us off, and given us into the hand of Midian. Is Gideon being pious or is he annoyed? Is he frustrated? Well, you have to read the story to find out what best fits the character of Gideon. 
at this point. Because so often, you know, we read these stories through rose-tinted spectacles. We're already at the foot of the cross. We've already chosen our final hymn and the wording of the altar call before we pay attention to the details of this. And the way in which you apply tone of voice means you have to have a clear understanding of how this narrative is working. So you need to spend time. You need to spend time with it. Um, then, another way, and a major way in which the Bible conveys the kinds of characters, what these characters are like, is through, com uh, through contrast, comparison and contrast. Um, now, sometimes, you have a contrast between one character and another in the same narrative. So, an explicit example of that is in Genesis chapter 38, concerning Judah and Tamar. Um, so, you remember, at this particular point in the story, Ta uh, Judah has said that Tamar should be uh, burnt because of uh, her indiscretion shall we put it that way. And as she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, it was the owner of these who made me pregnant. And she said, take note please, whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, she is more in the right than I. So here you got an explicit contrast given by one of the characters saying, she is more righteous than I am. And that contrast between one character and another gives us an insight into what kind of characters we are dealing with. How should we judge Tamar? We get an explicit contrast in this narrative with Judah, which indicates how we should do so so that we're not just guessing. Um, then you get contrasts in different narratives. And here we have a contrast between different characters in different narratives, all right? So if we stay with Genesis 38 for a moment, the story of Judah and Tamar, in verses 15 and 16, we get this account. Uh, you remember that just Briefly, the background to this, Tamar has not been uh, given in marriage to one of Judah's sons, so she disguises herself as a prostitute on the side of the road. And when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her at the side of the road and said, come, let me come into you. He's a fairly direct kind of fellow, is Judah. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. That's Genesis 38. The next episode in Genesis 39 concerns Joseph and Potiphar's wife. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. She's fairly direct, but he refused and said to his master's wife, look, with me here, my master has no concern about anything in the house, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself because you are his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So here we have two adjacent episodes. In the first episode, Judah approaches Tamar thinking she is a prostitute and directly asks for sexual favors from her. In the second episode, Potiphar's wife directly approaches Joseph and asks him for sexual favors, which he refuses. Now, there's a stark contrast here, is there not? And that stark contrast can perhaps best be uh, underlined by asking this question. If Potiphar's wife had approached Judah, what would Judah have responded? Probably not as Joseph did. So 
the, this, this contrast between Judah in chapter 38 and Joseph in chapter 39 underlines once again the kind of characters they are. Once again, the narrator does not explicitly judge either of them and tell us how we should assess both, but he tells us what Judah says and does, and right next to it, he tells us what Joseph says and does, and then says, you make the comparison, the contrast. What do you make of that? And, and I think the contrast is fairly, fairly obvious. But in doing all of these, um, or, or sorry, in um, exploring these various ways in which biblical narratives present characters, we may wonder um, how, what weight do we put on this piece of evidence or that piece of evidence? Uh, and where do we just sort of maybe think uh, in unbridled imaginative ways and come up with anything? Well, I think what's um, helpful is if we look at uh, this, which is, oh, sorry, there's another one as well. I, I, that's right, I put this in, no extra charge for this one, okay. Um, in Genesis 37, we have Judah once again. And in uh, Genesis 37, Judah said to his brothers, they're there at the pit where Joseph has been placed. And Judah, Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? You know, we might as well get some money out of it. Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he's our brother, our own flesh. Then in Genesis 44, this is where Judah is um, there with Joseph, just before Joseph reveals himself, and Joseph has said that Benjamin must stay in Egypt with Joseph. And Judah speaks here, and he says to Joseph, now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, now therefore, please let your servant remain as a slave to my Lord in place of the boy, and let the boy go back with his brothers. In chapter 37, Judah is opportunistic. We might as well get some money from selling him. And the result of that, as we know, is that Jacob is convulsed in grief at the loss of Joseph. That's in chapter 37. But in chapter 34, Judah is willing to say, I'll be a slave rather than you keep Benjamin here. Let me stay with you as a slave. I cannot bear the, the idea that my father will suffer. Well, obviously, the, the Judah of chapter 44 is not the same man as the Judah of chapter 37. The narrator does not say, by the way, please note how mature Judah now is. No, it's given us Genesis 37, then gives us Genesis 44, and asks us to make the comparison. So here's a classic example of where it would be foolish to expect characters to act consistently because Judah does not act consistently. He grows, he matures, he changes. And you could preach a far worse sermon than a sermon on the life of Judah. Beginning at the beginning and working its way up here to a position where he's much more, much more righteous, you might say. Now, in looking at, um, oh, sorry, that's right. So let me come to this, which is called Alter's Scale of Certainty. Robert Alter is a, a, liter a literary scholar. He wrote a, a groundbreaking book in the early 1980s called The Art of Biblical Narrative. Reading that uh, book was uh, one of, well, it was my road to Damascus experience when it came to understanding biblical narratives. What Alter's scale of certainty is, is this. When we look at the various clues given to us in biblical narratives concerning characters, what weight do we place on various elements? And Alter suggests a sliding scale of certainty when it comes to assessing a character. So at the bottom of the scale, we have a character's actions or physical appearance. You can derive something about a character from their 
uh, actions and physical appearance. Yes, you can, you can derive something, but it's limited. More useful are a character's direct speech or what other characters say about him or her. We can be a bit more certain about drawing conclusions about a character from that kind of evidence. Then a degree of greater certainty would be a character's inner speech. He said to himself, she thought. That's getting us closer to certainty as far as assessing a character. But what gives us the greatest certainty in understanding what a character is about would be the final point, the narrator's explicit assessment of a character's actions and intentions. This is when the narrator tells us starkly point blank, for example, King Ahab was the worst king that Israel ever had. We don't say of that, listen to that deliberate ambiguity on the part of the narrator. No, there's no ambiguity, straightforward, that's it. So the narrator's explicit assessment is the one on which we can have greatest choice. Nevertheless, all four of those steps are utilized in biblical narrative, but this is a sliding scale of certainty as far as making conclusions about a character. There's something we need to uh, bear in mind as well, and that is the inter interplay between ourselves as readers or hearers of these stories and the characters in these stories themselves. So a significant element in reading these stories is what we can call point of view. And this helps us to assess characters. So let's illustrate that here. We can get different points of view. If we begin with readers, ourselves, if we're looking at a narrative, it's helpful to ask ourselves this quest these questions. What do we know? As readers and hearers, what do we know? Secondly, when do we know it? And thirdly, how do we know it? We're the readers. What do we know, when do we know, and how do we know? And then ask this question of the characters. What do they know? When do they know it? And how do they know it? Because a common mistake in reading biblical narratives is to assume that if we know it, the characters must know it. Frequently that's a mistake that is made, but that is clearly not the case. The point of view of the reader and the point of view of the characters can often and frequently be very different. So let me illustrate that by looking at a New Testament narrative in which we get multiple points of view, just to illustrate what I'm talking about here. In, in Luke chapter 24, we have the story of the, the road to Emmaus, very familiar story from the New Testament. In verses 15 to 16, we read, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now at this point in the story, the readers know, but the characters do not know. Well, what do the readers know? The readers know that it's Jesus, but the characters do not know that it's Jesus. So the point of view of the readers and the point of view of the characters are not the same. Then later in the same story, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted, that he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. Well here, 
The characters know, but the readers do not know. What do the characters know? Well, the characters know what particular things in the Old Testament Jesus expounded. But we do not, for we are not told. So the content of the Bible study is known to the characters, but it isn't known to us, the readers. And then, at the climax of the story, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them, and then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Well, by the time we get here, the readers know, and the characters know. We've known all along that it is Jesus, but it is only here that the characters know that it is Jesus. So at various points in this story, the point of view of the readers and the point of view of the characters is not the same until we get to the end. So, this distinction is actually quite, quite important insofar as it's often overlooked. When we look, talk about the knowledge of the characters and the knowledge of the readers, when we're reading a narrative, we're reading a narrative, preparing a sermon, we need to distinguish between what the characters know, what the readers know, at this point in the narrative. As an example, uh, I've lost track of the number of sermons I've heard on Abraham, who, and in those sermons, because we know how the story will end, we assume that Abraham already knows that at the beginning, but he doesn't. What does he know at this particular point? And what do we know at that particular point? Uh, and let me illustrate that from a, an, uh, an episode in the story of Abraham. What Abraham and Sarah know. In chapter 17, uh, we read this. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Now, if you just look at uh, the basic elements here, um, there's the announcement, I will give you a son by her. I'll give you a son by Sarai. Sarai is going to have a child. Abraham's response, he fell on his face and laughed. Why does Abraham fall on his face and laugh? Because he's never heard it before. This is the first time in the story that Abram's been told, anybody has been told, that Sarai's going to have a child. Some of you are looking at me as if I've lost my senses, but believe me, this is true. This is the first announcement that Sarai will have a child. He falls flat on his face, laughs out loud because it's unbelievable he hasn't heard it before. And then he says, how can it possibly be? That's in chapter 17. Chapter 18. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I've grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? And you can see that Sarah's response in chapter 18 duplicates, replicates Abraham's response in chapter 17. There's the announcement that your wife Sarah shall have a son. Sarah laughs to herself, just like Abraham did. And she says, how is it possible? Just like Abraham did. Now, what do we learn from those similarities? I'd suggest we, we learn this. 
Um, if we go, if we just look at, um, this is the statement there in chapter 18, um, where Sarah hears that she's going to have a child. Now, in chapter 18, which is where Sarah hears she's going to have a child, Abraham already knows that Sarah will have a child because he was told back in chapter 17, remember, when he fell flat on his face. So Abraham already knows that Sarah will have a child. Therefore, readers, we already know that Sarah will have a child. How do we know it? Because we heard the announcement to Abraham in chapter 17. So Abraham knows that Sarah will have a child. Readers know that Sarah will have a child. But Sarah does not know that she will have a child. And why do we say that? Because Sarah's response when she hears that she's going to have a child replicates the response of Abraham when he first heard that she was going to have a child. Her response is the response of someone who's never heard it before, just as Abraham's response was that of someone who'd never heard it before. Therefore, what do we conclude? If Abraham knows that Sarah will have a child, and readers know that Sarah will have a child, but Sarah does not know that she will have a child, the only thing we can conclude, I'd suggest, is that even though Abraham has known for some time that Sarah will have a child, he has not told her. And what insight into marital relations might that give us? Your wife has not been able to have a child for so many years. You've been told by God that she will have a child, but you haven't told her. Well, I'll leave that for your sanctified imaginations to work with. I think, and my, my knowledge of contemporary or, or, or recent American history, uh, American history is not as great as any of you, of course, but I believe in the Watergate investigation, a, uh, a question was addressed to President Nixon, and that was, what did you know, and when did you know it? That's a good question to ask when you're reading biblical narratives. What do we know, and when do we know it? Um, there's an exercise that I think you would find uh, helpful, and I'm going to ask you to do that now, and it concerns Daniel chapter 6. So in the rest of the time that we have available then, uh, I'd like to ask you to do uh, these three brief tasks. First of all, you're going to get um, a handout here, which is um, simply the text of Daniel chapter 6. And I'd like you to read through Daniel 6 and identify um, the characters in that narrative. Which of those characters are flat? That is to say, they have one characteristic, but they don't develop. All right? Which of the characters are agents? That is, they're there in order to move the story on, but um, they don't have a major role to play. And which are the round characters? Which are the most complex characters in the story? Once you've done that, then choose a round character. You can then forget the flat characters and the agents, but choose a round character and um, document the contribution made to their characterization by what they say, what they do, what others say about them, and how that character interacts with other characters. And then just write a brief summary of the traits of that character. Imagine you're writing a reference for somebody who's wanting a job, okay? This character has these characteristics. 